So looking kind of at some of the key elements that, that these different movements really have in common. Protest uh, as art and art as protest. Um, radically critical, anti-nationalist, anti-colonialist in its approach. Um, in the case of Dada, we saw it being kind of anarcho-individualist as well as anarcho-communist, uh, but not nihilistic. And I really want to kind of wipe that out at the very beginning because there have been so many kind of misconceptions about it. And it's kind of weird you think, well, how can the kind of like the individualist and the communist kind of meld? That's really a different conversation, but I'm gonna bring your attention to the book table at City Lights that for the next week has probably more Dada books on it than any other bookstore in the country. So, um, but it's something to consider because these things are actually very, very important. Two, um, attack on consensus reality, attack on bourgeois sensibilities, on consumerism, revealing the hypocrisy in society, uh, re revealing the agenda of the elite economic class. And I think in this way that you can really see the connections between Dada and things like the Occupy movement, or maybe even Ed Snowden, who knows? Maybe we can talk about that too. They were very much into shock tactics, uh, exaggeration, ridicule, sarcasm, working with polarity, uh, the idea, as I said earlier, of going between yes and no, um, focusing on the grotesque and the absurd is another element. Uh, all we have to do is really look at the work of George Grosh, of John Hartfield, of Raoul Hausman, actually even Winston has played a lot with the grotesque. He just came up with a, a wonderful poster, actually, that had kind of flames coming out of our, uh, our Fuhrer's head. Um, and then last but not least, short-circuiting culture, culture jamming, which can also be kind of tied into shock tactics, but it's, it's really the conscious idea that uh, you want to kind of bring awareness to the illness that pervades culture. So that is to say a culture that kind of can allow the slaughter of millions of people for the sake of profit and amusement of the few. And this is really what, you know, what the Dadaists were responding to. It's like many of them had survived World War I or knew of people that had not survived, and uh, this had a huge impact on the kind of work that they produced. Um, so let's talk now about the thread itself. Um, and I'll take a few liberties. Um, Black Lives Matter, Occupy, the zine and independent music explosion, uh, the new collage explosion, uh, things like De Desert Sight Works and the Cacophony Society, Suicide Club, industrial music, uh, the machine art of organizations like SRL, Seaman, Cal Spelatech, Matt Heckert's work. There is, of course, punk itself. Um, Communiversity, Gary Warren, uh, mail art, Ulipo, Fluxus, Situationism, Lettrism, The Diggers, The Black Panther Party, Happenings, Actionists of Vienna, The Machine Art of Jean Tengele, Buto, The Beat Culture, Art from Mid-Century California Artists, Outlaw Culture and Root Folk Music, Jazz Music, Surrealism, Burlesque and Vaudeville. I even include the Marx Brothers, Greek Rebetica, Why Not? The Men with the Pointy Shoes. And of course, we reach Dada. And um, the continuum, as I mentioned earlier, can kind of bounce around a little bit. Um, so I want to actually begin with this thread, because I think it actually ties in a little bit to what we're experiencing right now. Um, Boris Vian, uh, who was a French musician and esthete, and part of a kind of a cabaret culture movement um, in Paris produced a wonderful, wonderful classic of absurdist theater called The General's Tea Party. And uh, it has a bunch of generals kind of like sitting around plotting the destruction of the world for their own amusement. Uh, so if we fast forward, um, 
consider the wonderful hoax that the UK punk group Crass created during the Reagan era. So members of the group took existing speeches by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, chopped them up to create a doomsday conversation where the two of them are planning nuclear war. And um, so Crass is utilizing the cut-ups and thinking about also the work of Tristan Zara because uh, it doesn't really end with Burroughs and Geisen. Uh, you really have to go back to Cabaret Voltaire and Tristan Zara chopping up poems, putting them into a hat and pulling them out randomly, which at that time caused a riot. Well, Crass caused a riot. And, uh, and it doesn't end there. We can go way past Dada into the past and we find ourselves having to confront the work of Alfred Jari. And to the right, we have Per Ubu, our president. And um, Per Ubu was a despotic leader who was bent on annihilation, uh, in the end, his own. And uh, I could say, you know, elements of the grotesque once again, you know, I mean, we have very, very strong similarities here. So um, we keep kind of coming back to um, artists dealing with trauma. And uh, I'm gonna go forward now to the post-war period and talk a little bit about Buto, which is the da Japanese dance theater that emerged at the end of World War II, which very much subverted conventional notions of dance. Uh, it created a formalization of distress. Oftentimes the, event would, the events would happen in public, sometimes without announcement. Uh, for example, it might happen in a room like this where somebody might just rip off all their clothes and begin creating gestures and movements and others would join in and before you know it, um, something was happening. It was very shamanic in, in, in many, many ways. There were strong literary influences to Buto. Uh, they had read Yukio Mishima, La Tremonde, Antonin Artaud, Jean Genet, de Sade. Um, and oftentimes you'd find Buto players howling silently, attempting to scream. And I bring up Howell and I bring up Allen Ginsberg because Buto came out right approximately at this time. Um, and starving, naked, hysterical Buto players look starving, hysterical, naked. Um, this was a kind of a, in some ways, um, not exactly a violent approach. Leroy Jones, Amiri Baraka had a different tactic. Um, Black Dada Lealismos was not a passive approach. It was not a defeatist approach, which Howell in some ways is, is a protest poem, but there is a defeatist element. Um, Amiri Baraka went on the war path with this poem. It's available on YouTube. I encourage you, all of you to uh, check it out. Um, Tongo Eisen Martin, did a mashup of this poem on opening night of Dada World Fair that was phenomenal. Um, very, very important moment um, and which fed into other important moments that came a little bit before and a little after on the upper hand right is Bruce Connor. There is a show at MoMA which I suggest all of you catch. Uh, beneath him is one of his pieces in a state of decay Above, on the other side, is a piece by George Herms. Beneath it is George Herms itself. And at the center is the seal of the Rat Bastard Protective Association, which brought together both Herms and Connor and Michael McClure, a beat, and many, many others. Uh, they had strong connections to Wallace Berman and Semina Journal from LA. Uh, Dennis Hopper was also involved with his photography. Um, this was part of the beat thing, but not really. Um, I mean, it really kind of, it's funny, I, I uh, interviewed Ruth Weiss, who is now approaching her 90s, 
about a year ago, we were celebrating the Sixth Gallery uh, tribute uh, at City Lights, and uh, we were talking about the term beat, and she said, you know, I, I hate the word. I always hated the word. She said, you know, I thought of ourselves as neo-Dadaists. And I thought, I had just this amazing affirmation, because here we are, we're planning for Dada World Fair, and she just, you know, like said exactly what I had wanted to hear, and she said, you know, you have to understand there were these amazing clubs and, you know, and crash pads and apartments, and because San Francisco was so affordable, you know, you could work two or three days a week and still have money left over to buy art supplies or guitar strings or, you know, whatever happy drug you wanted. And the parties would often go on and on. And they would begin, and it was just this ongoing, wonderful mishmash, kind of like what we had at Dada House the other night. But they were just more common and happened more often. And it brought together musicians from the jazz clubs. It brought in artists from San Francisco Art Institute. Um, it brought in uh, all kinds of misfits and politicos, and they were all swimming around in the same ocean. And this later kind of led to things like happenings. Um, some of the same people got involved in things that were very Alan Caprell kind of, you know, inspired, but, uh, you know, it also opened up into the 60s, and some of those people also became involved with the diggers, and became involved with the coquettes, and became involved with the angels of light. And again, we're looking at kind of protest art. We're looking at art that's art of the absurd, um, and that's very, very critical of culture. Uh, upper left-hand corner is the San Francisco Art Institute. To the right is City Lights. There is a kind of sort of, uh, hub of activity, not just around North Beach. I mean, it used to extend into the Fillmore at one time. It used to extend into the Mission. That has changed because the demographics of San Francisco have changed. But there has always been these wonderful relationships between, again, institutions like the Art Institute, bookstores like City Lights. There was the Mabuhe Gardens. And we're going to talk with Vale in a little bit about kind of that interesting feedback loop between punk rock and the beats and the literary scene. On the right, we have the Deaf Club. Um, Bruce Connor was a regular at Mabuhe Gardens. If you haven't seen his photographs, he has a collection of photographs of the punk scene that are absolutely brilliant. Um, and uh, so we have this kind of very interesting sort of feedback loop. Philip Lamantia, who is known to be a beat, but prior to that was really a surrealist. In fact, Andre Breton published Lamantia way before beat was a thing. Uh, so again, we see these kind of interesting threads. So let's jump somewhere else now, talk a little bit about Fluxus. Um, so it's both a kind of a protest art, but it's also a kind of a defeatist art. And it's also toying with expectation. And of course, you know, Yoko Ono, we're all familiar with. Um, some of the other Fluxus people we might not be, we may or may not kind of go more into detail, but I have to invoke Fluxus because so many of the tactics of Fluxus like run parallel to Dada, playing with expectation, playing with outrage, um, playing with, um, you know, decay, playing with you know, the kind of things that, that you know, people like Bruce Conner and George Herms also addressed in the 50s. Um, and then this later kind of worked its way into mail art. Some of the same people went on to mail art, but also um, there was another current which was happening kind of at the same time, which was Viennese actionism. And uh, there's some very, very interesting kind of parallels between uh, people like Otto Mühl and Hermann Nitsch both of which went to jail for their performances. Some of them were extremely radical, and they were kind of invoking the massacres at places like Belsen and Dachau. And again, like the Butoh players who were kind of dealing with you know, the atomic holocaust of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, Nish and Mule and others were considering you know, like art in relation to, you know, again, trauma. 
Uh, one of my favorite, favorite performances of theirs is when they got a whole bunch of very, very affluent people in dinnerware, penned up like cattle, and, and basically had an abattoir in the center, and no one could escape, but they had to kind of slaughter pretty much these creatures that were in the middle of the abattoir, sadly for the creatures, but, but it, uh, it was one of the events that they get into a lot of trouble for. Um, and of course, we got to talk a little bit about punk, which kind of like follows hot on the heels and the shock tactics of punk, of course, are very well known to most of us. Um, and of course, huge, huge influenced, hugely influenced by situationism. Um, I really have to kind of invoke the name of, of Jamie Reed, who's a designer, upper left-hand corner. We have the 45 for Holidays in the Sun, um, which really kind of directly addresses, you know, the hypocrisy uh, in the UK. Uh, it opens with this preamble, a cheap holiday in other people's misery. Um, and really kind of is goading the bourgeoisie. Um, so we see kind of illuminated the stark realization, like whether you're behind the Iron Curtain or whether you're in front of it, repression and slavery is pretty much the same. Colonialism has its own trajectory. So Jamie Reed was really playing with, if you look in the lower corner, one bus says nowhere, the other bus says boredom, of course, there's the very famous God Save the Queen, which we all know about. But then, in the upper right-hand corner, very self-effacing and, and sort of presaging the demise of the group and saying, you know what, even we are complicit. That's a American Express Sex Pistols card. So uh, situationists were a direct influence on Jamie Reed, on Malcolm McLaren, on the pistols themselves. Um, Guy Debord and um, Raoul Vanagheim in uh, Society of the Spectacle and the Revolution of Everyday Life. Um, if you look through Sex Pistols lyrics, but then if you look through the lyrics of a lot of other punk bands, you will find much the same sentiments. Uh, so if you cross the ocean to America at around the same time, uh, you have lyrics like, it's the American in me that makes me watch the blood run out of the bullet hole in his head. It's the American in me that makes me wonder why Kennedy was murdered by the FBI. And of course, that was the Avengers. <laughs> Following the Avengers, you had the dead Kennedys. Um, my wife knows a woman whose dad was one of the pathologists that actually presided over Kennedy's body. He saved the smock and actually put it under glass as a memento. It was a very weird thing. They lived in the Bay Area. One day, his daughter took the smock out of the glass and wore it to a dead Kennedy's concert. <laughs> um, she kept telling people, you know, you're not going to believe this. And they're like, no, we don't. <laughs> but it was true. And I, that, the power of that moment in my mind um, is huge. Um, and I think we go back to Guy Debord, we go back to the idea of spectacle, and we have to begin to think about, like, you know, what exactly has happened to us, you know? And, you know, what I think that, you know, everyone we've kind of looked at so far has, has attempted to do is kind of bring this to the foray and sort of like snap us out of our trance of consuming and bring us a little bit closer again to citizenry. Um, there are a lot of contemporary artists that follow within these currents. Upper left-hand corner is John Sim. Uh, he's the artist who married two gay, a gay Confederate soldier to a gay Union soldier in a ceremony in the South where the Confederate flag was hung on a noose behind them. So I cannot tell you uh, uh, how that freaked out a lot of people in the most wonderful, wonderful way. He's also taken the Confederate flag and, and colored it in different colors and kind of like Rasta configurations and many, many other colors. He's really a brilliant, brilliant artist. Uh, there is Trevor Paglin in the right side who has been researching covert military sites around the world and uh, also has 
created these amazing sculptures. He created a radioactive sculpture that was collected from glass from Los Alamos that's in kind of a, a secret location that you, know, you have to kind of like arrange with him to visit. Um, and also he's been in touch with uh, Fukushima artists who have been working inside the radioactive zone and no one can really see the art they're making but they have been documenting it. But it's really incredible work and, and, and very timely work. We have Reverend Billy in the lower right hand corner who I think he gets arrested like once or twice a month. I mean, it, 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 he's, he's really quite wonderful and I think some of you probably already know who he is. And then on the upper uh, lower right hand, left hand corner is Callie Lasney of Adbusters Magazine, who uh, is really an amazing, amazing um, designer, uh, but also kind of a theorist together with people like Mackenzie Wark, Finn Brunton, David Graeber, and I can kind of go on and on and on and on, but I'm just gonna run through a few more slides. Um, on the right is John Hartfield, and uh, his grandson, uh, also named John Hartfield, was at uh, Winston Smith Space a few days ago, and it was really a wonderful event where we got to see a lot of imagery from his grandfather. Um, this is Winston. Uh, do we see a resemblance? Maybe a little resemblance there. Um, <laughs> I dyed my beard. Um, but then there's Winston again on the left side, and then we have Hannah Hoch on the right side. And um, I'm just going to let the images sort of speak for themselves. This is a Jean Tangele event uh, that took place in France in the Cal. Was that the late 50s or the this, this early 60s? In Roma in New York City. In New York City. Homage to New York. Right. I would say apropos. This is a survival research event. I don't know when this is, but probably in the 80s or 90s. Um, here we have the Futurists. And here we have Matt Heckard, who's going to be in duet with Cal on Sunday, and one of his sculptures. And here is one of Cal's sculptures. And on that note, I actually want to kind of bring you into this dialogue, Cal. And um, I mean, you've obviously been touched by Futurism. Uh, but I think, you know, you've, you've also kind of equally been touched by, I think, the kind of optimism that Kurt Schwitters, like kind of a playfulness that Kurt Schwitters has. I mean, I see that in your work, like especially like in your, your, your moving trees and stuff and, and things like that. So I'm just kind of wondering, um, when you think of this continuum that I've sort of evoked, um, that brings all these kind of strains of culture together, I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you personally walk away with? And, and what, what is, you know, kind of, what does it evoke the last 10 minutes? if anything. Well, Peter, um, big question. Thanks everyone for coming. And um, thanks for doing this, Peter. Appreciate it. My pleasure. It's a stellar lineup here. Riff raff. Um, <laughs> bum, 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 bum. You know, I, I think I recognized almost every image. And so I, in a way, all of those people have changed my life and I keep trying to learn about them. And, oh, Matt just walked in. Yeah. Um, what's the question? <laughs> um, how are we going to secede from California? How are yes. we going to use so, art uh, to uh, create a, a strong secessionist movement? You know what, I, uh, I, we talked about that last night. I kind of couldn't just sit home. I was trying to work in my studio and went to the protest march, and it felt so good, and people were talking about it. And uh, what do we do next? And a lot of my students were there, and really great young energy. And what I could suggest to them is keep working and find your voice and claim a space and hold it. And don't give a shit what people think. And, and, and that sadly maybe includes your family. You can't be a radical and think about what other people, uh, can't worry about offending other people. And, uh, Dada gave me that. Um, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence gave me that. Punk rock for sure gave me that. I mean, when I first went to my first art museum show, which wasn't until I was about 21 or 22, I was appalled at how boring it was. And just, because I, I had been going to punk shows, and I thought, well, I'm not doing this with my art. 
but I'm going to be an artist, and I'm going to I want to be moved like I moved at a punk show, where I'm scared and confused and excited and happy and partying and celebrating, and pretty quick I realized it's not the museums or these mainstream venues, it's the weird dark alley you go down to find something radical. I mean, later you could might end up in a, uh, a nice basement of, a basement of a library, <laughs> and, and, and I've had a bunch of shows in museums, for better or worse, but uh, you know, the cool stuff is at the weird places, and I, did I answer the question? <laughs> Beautifully, baby, beautifully. <laughs> so, Winston, wake up. Um, there was a moment when you and Hartfield were talking, and I, I just, it was hard not to get kind of teary eyed and had the hair kind of stand on end and just kind of realize that there was this like amazing bridge that had formed between now and the time that that his grandfather was being chased around Germany by the fucking Gestapo. And, you know, and, and I, I think I, I talked to several people who were, you know, at the event. And um, for those of you who came in late, uh, the grandson of John Hartfield uh, gave a talk in a PowerPoint over at Winston Studio last Saturday, which was really incredible. He showed a lot of images. He talked about the politics of the day, what was happening in Berlin. It was really an amazing show. So I, I just, um, you know, I got to say there was just a moment where I was really kind of moved by all of it. Tell me a little bit about, like, you know, what you came away with it from. With it was, uh, you know, he was saying that um, because we were talking for a couple hours before the event took place, and we said, "Gee, how come we never knew each other before this?" And uh, we're separated at birth. And uh, although I was, you know, he was looking at my artwork and saying, "Oh, this reminds me of my granddad's things," and I didn't even know about Hartfield's work until after 1984. Uh, it was during the the. Um, um, during the um, Democratic Convention to, no, the, yeah, the Democratic Convention when Reagan was running for re-election. Mm -hmm. And um, a friend of mine in Fragic Gulato showed me, um, Alistair showed me this book. I said, oh, how come I never knew about this guy? I recognized some of the pictures, but I didn't know who it was. And it occurred to me that, and I was telling John, when I do stuff or when we all do the nonsense or inspired or whatever we think of it, our activities, our artistic activities, we kind of just do it for fun or we do it because we're inspired or to inspire others. But when his grandfather was doing that, they were going to kill his ass. You know, they, they had a price on his head. They, he was a hunted, wanted, dead or alive. You know? And uh, I often have wondered if I'd be quite so, um, you know, uppity and um, uh, you know, uh, pointing out rude things. Uh, if I had the Gestapo chasing me, uh, I, I think a lot of us, you know, might you know think twice about it. Uh, but he was like running from country to country to you know to survive, and finally, uh, finally did did sit out the war during um, you know I guess in England, and then afterward had to return to of all places East Germany, and. It's a, you know, like out of the frying pan into the fire. But uh, you know what his um, his grandfather had done, and what John—he's a musician, so he has another way of expressing himself. Um, but he does have a, um, a, a a very good presentation. He's a professor, so that helps. He's you know obviously you can tell I'm not a public speaker. So, but he, in his case, he has that talent and skill. And um, uh, to present what his grandfather did, it's as relevant now as it was then, uh, you know, not to draw too close a comparison to Brother Trump and Adolf Hitler uh, or Mussolini, but <laughs> there are certain <laughs> comparisons that can be made. Um, and I'm kind of glad he's chosen this time to go around and do these presentations. It's like he was available, it was a, a kind of a, a miracle. You said when he called you and said, yeah, hi, I'm John Hartfield. Well, uh, can we come in and do a thing there? And you said, yeah, right, I'm the Queen of England. Uh. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad you uh, sorted that out before you hung up on him. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to actually take a moment to um, have Emily give a little presentation about zines and magazines and print culture. 